Well, good morning, Kesed Church. Um, now, some of you may know me, and some of you may just recognize me from things like the announcement videos, um, but my name is Alyssa Athey. I have the privilege of working here at Kesed Church as the Director of Creative Arts, um, and I also have the privilege this morning of introducing our guest speaker to you guys. Um, some of you will recognize her. Uh, she shared with us here at Kesed about uh, just a little over a year ago, or a little under a year, my bad, um, and she also helped lead worship over at our Main Street campus when we were having services there, um, and when she shared with us, she, we had a wonderful response to her message and just to her. and. It ended up being the most uh, viewed sermon on our Vimeo page, um, and so we absolutely knew we had to bring her back, and she just had so much more to share with us, and especially on a day like today where we are recognizing the women and the mothers in our lives, I think it's just incredibly powerful to be able to have a mother's perspective, being able to share this, their message with us this morning, and to be able to bring that to our Mother's Day sermon. Um, so first off, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. Happy Mother's Day to everyone in the audience, and can we give a big Kesa Church welcome to Ronnie Sasaki. Woo, good morning. I cannot tell you what an honor and a privilege it is to be here, especially for Mother's Day. If you were here back in August and you heard my story where I shared that I had been born with one leg, and then I went on to win a gold medal in the Paralympics in ski racing on one leg, then I guess you could say that being a mom is part two of my story. Because when I won that gold medal, I was actually two months pregnant with my son. And when I retired shortly thereafter from ski racing, I ended up having three children in five years. Now, I'm here to tell you that being a mother of three toddlers is very different than being a full-time ski racer. <laughs> but this is really true. Being a mom takes more drive, more work, more determination. It is more joyful. And as far as being a great accomplishment, there's really not even any comparison to winning a gold medal than there is to being a mom. But the thing is, is when you're a mother, Nobody ever calls me up and says, hey, we want to do a news story about you being a mom. I never have anybody call me up and say, hey, let's put you on the cover of our magazine and do a story about being a mom. I've never received a gold medal for having three children, and certainly nobody has ever played the national anthem in my honor because I am a mother. I don't think that's right. Now, growing up in church, we did have some really cheesy Mom Day awards. Things like, you know, who is the oldest mother in the room? Now, what woman in her right mind is going to admit to that? <laughs> and then, you know, who has the most children? Well, you know who she is, right? She's the one that's running in and out constantly because she's dealing with so many children. And then there's always this one, what I never stood a chance of winning, it's who has the youngest baby on Mother's Day. That's great for those of you that have early May babies, but what about the rest of us who have our kids in, in June and October like me? So being the very competitive person that I am, I think we should make it fair so that everybody could possibly have a chance of getting a Mother's Award. I did not bring prizes today, so don't get your hopes up too high. But I do think we should acknowledge some very special women in our audience today. So here we go. Would the mother, or even mothers, who is likely to have, have a kid or has ever had a kid who might dump an entire Costco-sized bottle of baby powder, all of it, into their closet because they wanted to make it snow. Would you please raise your hand? <laughs> Woohoo! Congratulations! Great job. Okay, would the mother in this room who has a child who can scream loud enough to break glass please raise your hand? <laughs> Woohoo! That is a good one. Now, keep your hand up though. If you, as the mom, can actually scream louder than your children. Very important skill to have as a mom. We know this is true, right? And now for the final grand prize, the biggie. If you are the mother or ever have been the mother of a child who is likely to be suspended for three days from school for putting a fart bomb into a fellow student's backpack, so that they had to evacuate three classrooms because of the smell, and 
whose grandfather later said, son, the next time you feel the urge to fart in class, try doing the real thing because I'm pretty sure they can't suspend you for that. <laughs> Raise your hand. Am I the only one? Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, well, give me a hand. <laughs> Yay. Okay. No national anthem, though. We won't go that far here. Do you remember that moment when the doctor laid that newborn baby into your arms for the first time? And you're looking down at them, and you are just so enthralled by this innocent, lovely child. And you think to yourself, there is no way ever that this beautiful baby is going to be sassy, <laughs> disobey me, or do anything wrong because you just can't even imagine it in that perfect moment. And then our image is completely shattered as they grow up and start to do all these things that we can't even imagine our kids can come up with, right? And you know what the problem is? It's because we give birth to little sinners. <laughs> and guess what? They take after us. I remember overhearing a conversation that my husband was having with his mother, and he was just kind of complaining to her about all of the difficulties that we were having with our children at that time and some of the struggles that we were having as parents. And she says this, she goes, you know, son, what goes around comes around, and it's coming around. That's fine for him, right? Because my husband, he was a really unruly child, and he caused all sorts of problems for his parents, but what about me? I was just a really easy kid, never hardly did anything wrong, you know, very easy to raise. So why was it coming around for me? Well, then I remember just a couple of instances that might have given my parents just a little cause for concern. When I was five years old, I went to daycare because my mother worked full time. And I don't remember all the circumstances surrounding it, but it was something like this. I was happily, contentedly playing with a toy. And all of a sudden, this other little boy came up and grabbed my toy and took it away from me. He stole it. Can you imagine such a thing? Where was his mother at that time? Anyway, so. I was so upset, I began to scream and holler in an effort to make everybody around me join in to try to get my toy back from this little boy. I was throwing a major temper tantrum. And so the daycare people, they had to come over, investigate, and kind of mediate what was going on. And rather than punish that boy for being a thief and stealing my toy, they punished me for throwing a fit. Now they put me in timeout, and timeout in this daycare was you had to go to the sick room. The sick room was kind of like a glorified bathroom. It had a toilet, a sink, a cot, and a window. I sat on that cot, looking up at that window, and all of a sudden I got this really brilliant idea. I was going to show them. They can't mess with this one-legged girl. I pushed that cot over to the window, climbed up on top of it. I managed to push the window open and push that screen out. Somehow, I don't even know how, I got my legs up over the windowsill and I jumped down to the sidewalk below to freedom. And I began to run home. We lived about a mile away from the daycare. We were in Hazeldale at the time and I had to run up Hazeldale Avenue, cross over 76th Street onto 83rd Street, then take a right, Go down toward the freeway to get to our house. I knew the way exactly. Now, I was not a very good runner, but I am running with everything I have so that I can get home. I don't even know what I'm going to do when I finally get home. The first car that stopped was the police car. <laughs> and he says to me, just as I'm getting ready to cross over 76th Street, hey, little girl, where are you going? And I said, I'm going home. Well, apparently, that was the right answer because he said, okay, well, have a nice day. And he drove off. The next car that came along was the daycare people. They were not very friendly. I kind of laugh at this whole story because can you even imagine something like this happening today? <laughs> oh my goodness, with social media, these people would have been all over the news. But anyway, the daycare people said nothing, but they silently ushered me into the back seat 
of the car, took me back to the daycare, kept me in their sights until my parents showed up to pick me up and then actually take me home. And I always wondered, what did my mom think at that moment was my future potential? <laughs> Maybe she was hoping that someday I would be able to break free from Alcatraz or something like that. <laughs> anyway, if you've ever wanted to be the perfect mom, then you've come to the right place today. Now, I know about 50% of you in this room are not mothers. But is it OK with you? Do I have your permission today to really speak to the mothers? All right, Philippians 1.6 says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. You see, when we invite Jesus Christ into our hearts as our Lord and Savior, we ask him to forgive us our sins. He begins to enter into us and work in our lives to transform us from where we are to what he wants us to be. Now, this transformation process is absolutely amazing, and we take it one baby step at a time as God works in our life. And through this whole process of, I would like to say, becoming a better person, we get to experience the joy and this peace and certainly the grace of God. The problem is, in the world that we live in today, we get this idea in our minds that we are supposed to be perfect people. And I think this is especially true of mothers today because we get this whole thought that not only are we supposed to be perfect, but we're supposed to raise perfect children. Children who never are loud. They are never unruly. They certainly would never run away from us or do anything, never break any of the rules. We're going to raise these perfect children. And along the way, we're going to feed them all organic, sugar-free, dye-free food. We're going to have daily prayer meetings in our home with our children and daily Bible studies. And we will never miss a church service. We will never miss a school function. And God forbid that we ever miss a sporting event. Our children, our yards, and our homes are always clean and perfectly groomed, aren't they? And don't forget, we must always look beautiful, have everything just so like off the page of a fashion magazine, and have this athletically sculpted body. Oh, and did I forget? Highly successful career, where we just are raking in tons and tons of money we have all these expectations put on us and this image in our mind of how things should be. And I think it's magnified in our day and age by Facebook. Do you guys have any of those Facebook friends? You look at their posts, and they've got the perfect husband. They've got the perfect job. They are going on all these amazing vacations. Their kids are winning all kinds of awards. And you think to yourself, I want that. What am I doing wrong? There's something in my life that is not good enough that doesn't measure up, and we become a little bit jealous. I know I do. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, what's wrong with wanting to be better? Isn't that why we're in church today? We're trying to become better people? I mean, even Jesus said it. In the Bible, on Matthew 5, 48, it says, Be perfect, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, this whole idea of becoming more and more like Jesus is not the type of perfectionism that I am talking about here. So for today's talk, when I say perfectionism, I'm going to be referring to this definition that really has three components. The first, when I'm referring to perfectionism, is an unrealistic set of standards that can never be met yet keep us continually in a state of unrest and discontent because we can never do or be enough. Nothing in life quite ever measures up. The second component to this definition of perfectionism is this very humanistic approach to life. It's a deceiving belief that I am in control of everything around me. 
And then thirdly, not only do I put these expectations on myself, but I put them on everybody else, especially my family members. And somehow they never quite measure up either. Now, this sense of discontent in and of itself is not necessarily sin, but oftentimes it can lead to sin. Now, if there ever was a woman in the Bible who should have been perfect, it was Eve. Now, I don't know, preaching about Eve is crazy because she's probably the most notorious woman in the history of mankind because we all know that she was far from perfect, right? I mean, she's the one who ushered sin into the world. And yet you look at her life prior to that moment and she had it all. God formed her. One of the very last pieces that he created was woman. He didn't make her out of the dirt like he did Adam. He actually took one of Adam's rib and formed this beautiful woman. She was probably the most beautiful woman that has ever lived, this amazing masterpiece of God called woman. Now, he gave her then to this perfect man, this husband who just had been created. There was no sin in the world at all, so we know that Adam was probably very sensitive, very attentive to all of Eve's needs because there was no sin. You know there were no snarky comments that went back and forth between them, no misunderstandings. They had to have this perfectly loving relationship with each other. Now, Eve also had a lot of control. And I'm here to tell you, if you didn't already know this, that we women, we like to have a lot of control. And God had put her and Adam in charge of the garden, put them in charge of all of the animals and all of the plants and all of the trees. It was a paradise, beautiful place to live. Furthermore, they're both running around naked and they're not even ashamed of it. This is perfect life. Lee Eve was lacking absolutely nothing. There was one teensy, weensy little rule that God gave to them. Genesis 16 through 17, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, Danny preached about this in quite great detail a few weeks ago, if you were here, when he was preaching on the Lord's Prayer. When he got to the verse, lead us not into temptation, he talked a lot about Eve and her temptation and how sneaky that serpent was. He knew exactly what it was going to take to tempt Eve. Now, when we get to this part of the story, I have to tell you, I'm just a little bit in judgment of Eve. I think she was kind of dumb in a way because it's as if you see this happening. She's stepping into this temptation. I want to reach through those pages of the Bible and say, stop, don't do it. It's kind of like watching a scary movie, you know? Have you ever done that? And they suddenly play that music, that da-da, 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 and you know what's going to happen because you know it's coming. And then those people in that movie go, hey, let's go swimming right here. And you're like, no, stop. And that's exactly the way I feel about Eve. You see, that serpent was so sneaky. He knew Eve had a good life. If he'd have showed up that day with a chainsaw and said to her, hey, Eve, why don't you go cut down that tree? I don't think she would have even been remotely tempted by that. But what he did is he came along and he pointed out something in her life that was missing. Let's read it. Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You sure, surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, when we take this definition of perfectionism, those three main points, and we look at Eve's temptation and then her sin through the light of these, it makes perfect sense how Satan was able to trick Eve. The first thing he did was point out to her that there was something missing in her life. She was lacking being like God and knowing the difference between good and evil. And when she suddenly was made aware of this, she probably thought to herself, well, there is something more out there. I want it. I've got to have it. And then the second thing, she was in complete control. Rather than take this to God and ask him, you know, God, I just heard something today and I wanted to talk to you about it. She took matters into her own hands and decided that this was something that she could take care of right then and there. So she took the fruit and she ate of it. And not only did she eat of it, she had a lot of control over Adam. She gave it to him. He ate it. Sin was ushered into the world. Now, when we look at this third piece, this whole idea of being in judgment of those around us, she was with Adam and she was with the serpent. But who was she in judgment of at that time? Well, when I read between the lines, I get just a little bit of a feeling that in that moment, Eve is actually in judgment of God. Because I think, perhaps, she felt that God was holding out on her, that there was something more that he was denying her access to. So she took matters in her own hand, and she ushered sin into the world. Elliot's commentary put it like this. It was no mean desire which led her astray. She longed for more knowledge and greater perfection. She wished even to rise above the the level of her nature, but the means she used were in violation of God's command, and so she fell. Now, there's a few things that, that happened when Eve fell that really affect us as being mothers. To this day, there are things that because of what Eve did, we are dealing with today. And the first one is we know that Eve's actions had eternal consequences. What she did had an effect on the history of mankind. And believe it or not, that we as mothers have this massive responsibility that the things that we do also can have eternal consequences. Now, this is both good and sometimes it can feel kind of bad in a way, because when it's good, it's great. I like to believe that every good thing I pour out on my children, all of the love, all of the wisdom, all of the example that I can set in a good, positive way that they're going to hold on to, and that they're going to pass these things on to their own children, and then their children are going to pass it on to their children, and so on and so on. But remember, I'm a sinner too, so what about the bad things that I do? Those times when I completely lose my cool, And then I throw like an adult temper tantrum with my kids. And I say the wrong things. I say hurtful things to my kids that can possibly have a long lasting effect on them. What about those kinds of things? And I think some of that is why in my own mind I think, well, I gotta be a perfect mom. Because I don't wanna screw up my kids. And then secondly, Eve, in her sin, when God chose to punish her, he said this. Genesis 3.16, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now this whole bit with the husband ruling over us, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to put that aside right now, for a whole other sermon all unto itself, right? (laughs) This is Mother's Day. (laughs) But let's talk about this pain in childbearing. So when the woman is in labor now forevermore after Eve's sin, she is going to have pain 
in childbirth. And we as women know this. And we talk about our birthing experience, don't we? We all get together. I mean, I love going to a baby shower and all the experienced mothers. What do we sit and do? Like men share their fish catching stories, we talk about our labor and delivery stories. I think we really do this to scare the new moms in the room. <laughs> But because of Eve, we do have pain in childbirth. But the truth is, is that is actually really short-lived. No matter how long you felt that your labor actually was, when you look at it in the overall life of that child, it still is a very short period of time. Even Jesus knew this. In John 16, 21, he said, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby... She no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. How quickly for we forget the pain that we endured to bring that beautiful child into the world. But then the second part is, in pain you shall bring forth children. So because sin has now entered the world, not only do we suffer this physical pain of giving birth, but there actually can be pain in raising this child bringing them to adulthood, and then even beyond that, right? We see this is in Eve's life. Just a very short period of time after sin has entered the picture, she has two sons, Cain and Abel. And there's a bit of brotherly rivalry between them because both of these boys present sacrifices to God. God accepted Abel's sacrifice. He rejected Cain's sacrifice. So Cain... Rather than go bring an acceptable sacrifice to God, got it in his mind, he was going to kill Abel, which is what he did. So here you have this mother who should have been really a perfect mother. She had everything lined up for her to have this perfect life. And sin enters the world, and now one of her sons murders the other son. There is pain now in bringing up children, and there really is hardly a more extreme example of this. And I know that this seems just kind of dismal when we talk about it. At the very moment, though, when the human race seemed to be at one of its lowest points, this loving God who created us offers this beautiful picture of salvation to come. And it's even through Eve, the one who brought the sin is the very one that God promises salvation through. Genesis 3, 15, as God is cursing the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first promise that God has given of a Savior to come. Not only is he someday going to bring a Savior to the world, he is going to bring that Savior through a mom. He's going to bring that Savior through Eve's lineage, ultimately. And the Savior is Jesus Christ, the only perfect person who has ever lived. What it really boils down to with this whole idea of perfectionism, it's an issue of the heart. It's like, who am I allowing to sit on the throne of my heart? Is it God? Where we experience this beautiful transformation that he, he takes us through with peace and joy and grace? Or do we put ourselves on the throne? And in doing so, oftentimes we miss out on everything that God has planned for us. You know, God is not waiting for us to be more perfect. He's waiting for us to love him deeper. This is an issue of the heart. And you see, the first thing I think of when I think of, well, okay, love him deeper. How do I do that? I want to get it right. <laughs> All you perfectionists out there who relate to me can understand. I want to get it right. And I think we see how to get it right when we look at the story of Mary and Martha. Now, Martha, she's a woman after my own heart. This woman in the Bible, she struggled with perfectionism in a very big way. I'll read you the story, Luke 10, 38 through 32. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, 
who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion will not, which will not be taken away from her. You see, Mary got it right. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus. She was sitting in God's presence, looking up into his face, listening to his teachings, learning from him, learning how she can be more and more like him. Now, when Jesus is talking to Martha here, he's not saying to her, Martha, never cook dinner again, never serve again, never do dishes again, never work in the kitchen again. And I'll tell you what, I kind of wish he was saying that in this instance because I think that'd be a pretty cool Mother's Day, right? No, ever do dishes ever again. But that wasn't his point here. His point to Martha was, look at Mary. She actually got it right. You're so troubled by so many things. Matthew Henry put it this way. Sitting at Christ's feet signifies readiness to receive his word and submission to the guidance of it. Martha was providing for the entertainment of Christ and those that came with him. Here were respect to our Lord Jesus and right care of her household affairs. But there was something to be blamed she was for much serving, plenty variety, and exactness. Worldly business is a snare to us when it hinders us from serving God and getting good to our souls. Now, when we look at Martha's life, I think she had a pretty good life, just like Eve did. We know that she probably had a pretty big house, right? I mean, after all, she invited Jesus over, and chances are all of Jesus' disciples came with him. So she probably had plenty of food, an abundance that she was able to share with this group of people that came along with Jesus. I believe that she loved Jesus. She was a good person. She wanted to invite him into her home so that she could get to know him better, that she could deepen her relationship with him. But remember that serpent that came along and he was very sneaky in his temptation. Now, I don't know this for sure, but maybe somewhere along the lines, this little voice began to whisper into Martha's ear, and it said, you don't want to go sit with Jesus right now. Look at this party you're giving. I mean, it is going to be the talk of the neighborhood for months to come. You are going to become the hostess with the mostess. People will remember you from now until forevermore. In fact, someday, they're going to name this woman Martha Stewart after you because you are such a good hostess. So Martha got completely distracted from her true purpose in having Jesus over into her home. She got sidetracked into this idea that it should look a certain way and be a certain way, that what she had was not enough. So by golly, she was going to take everything in her power and make it good enough. And she missed the whole point. Furthermore, if she was going to miss it, Mary was going to miss it too. Because she was in judgment of Mary. Mary was not helping her. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And do you see the words that she brings to Jesus? She's not saying to him, Oh, Jesus, it's so good to have you here. I love you. I'm here just to worship you right now. No, she's critical of Jesus. So not only is she in judgment of Mary in this moment, she's actually judging Jesus because he is taking Mary away from being able to to help her. Mary got it right, and Jesus pointed that out to Martha. Martha almost missed everything that Jesus had for her that day because her focus got off of Jesus and onto herself and what she thought she could do. There's this beautiful space at Jesus' feet. When we come to him and we sit at his feet, sometimes we fall on our face at his feet. We listen, we learn, we shift our focus 
so that we get to become, instead of this perfect person, we get to become more like Jesus. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Now, I can tell you truthfully, I've always wanted to be a perfect mom. And I've always wanted to have perfect children. And this place at Jesus' feet, for me, has become a place where I get to surrender my children to him. Because, newsflash, they are not perfect children. And I am not a perfect mom. So I get to fall at Jesus' feet and learn from him and surrender myself and surrender my children to him. The first time we ever left our kids home alone, we had a plan. And I remembered back to a time when my kids were just toddlers. And I thought, how hard it was to be a mother of toddlers. And so I was sharing this with a friend of mine, Debbie Cantola. I says, you know, I can't even go to the bathroom alone. I can't wait till my kids get older, and then it will be a lot easier to be a mom. And she says to me, you know, Ronnie, man, I'm really sorry to disappoint you, but it doesn't get any easier. It just gets different. So when we come to this weekend where we are going to leave our kids home alone for the first time, we had a plan. They were old enough. My son was 18 years old. My daughters were older teenagers following right behind him. We laid out the rules exactly. You know, you're to be here at this point in time. You're supposed to be here on this day. And at this time, no parties, no guests. Don't let anybody know that you're home alone. We had it all planned out. All three kids agreed on the plan. Oh, yes, Mom, we promise, we promise, we will adhere to all of your rules. Everything's going to be just fine. You go away. You have a great time. Don't worry about a thing. Now, we were going to Antelope, Oregon, to compete in this thing called the Wild Canyon Games. And it was one of those really cool, extreme kind of sporting events where you go and you do for two and a half days or one and a half days, whatever it was, all these crazy athletic things. And the, but the thing is, is Antelope, Oregon, completely no cell phone coverage. Now, we knew this, so this was part of the plan, right? Now, kids, when we pull over those mountains on Friday afternoon, you're not going to be able to get a hold of us for any reason until Sunday afternoon when we come back over. Okay, no problem. We had all kinds of phone numbers for them, people standing by, ready just in case there was an emergency and they couldn't get a hold of us so my kids would be taken care of. So we went on away feeling very comfortable and very confident and very trusting of our children that everything was going to be great. And we had the time of our lives. Lots of pictures that I was so excited to post on Facebook to show the world how great my life is. And then we returned home. And there was this point I was driving the car we hit this like invisible wall. You know what it is? It's that electromagnetic field that you cross through and all of a sudden you have cell phone coverage. And in that instant, both of our phones began dinging. Ding, 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 ding. It sounded like a fire alarm going off. I looked over at my husband and said, that can't be good. And he began to play the message is one after the other, after the other, after the other. Half of them were from the county jail. The other half of them were from all of my family members who were telling me everything that had happened while we were gone. And my son, who had sat there and agreed to follow all the rules, all along he had been planning to have a big wild party at our house on Friday night. Now, as you might imagine, anything with drinking involved can quickly go sideways. And as it ended up, the police were called and they hauled my son to jail, which is where he sat from Friday night and was still there on Sunday afternoon when we crossed over into cell phone service. Now, I'm just going to tell you straight up, 
I had no intention of posting any pictures of him in his orange jumpsuit on Facebook. <laughs> and I thought to myself, for just one brief moment, before the anger completely kicked in, because I was still in shock, in disbelief that this is actually, hap actually had happened, I thought, he didn't even give me a chance to tell him how to break out. <laughs> because I know how to do that. Do you have a cot in your room? Is there a window up there somewhere? And then I got mad. I don't know if you've ever had a child hurt you, do things that break your heart. And yet I do believe in those instances, we just get a little taste of how God must have felt when Adam and Eve sinned. My perfect world was shattered. I was angry. I was hurt. I was embarrassed. I was in judgment. Believe you me, I was in judgment. And I remember in those moments of being completely out of control, there was no way I could get my son out of jail until Monday, if I really even wanted to get him out of jail at that point. I guess that remained to be seen, didn't it? But I later learned that he... He drank so much because he's always been a pretty small kid. And at 18, I mean, he may be treated as an adult by the legal system, but he still was just a kid, a dumb kid, yes. But his blood alcohol level was so high that it really was a miracle that he didn't kill himself drinking so much that night. And so for that, I was grateful because that gave me a chance to kill him the second he walked out of that cell. <laughs> so. But as mothers, you know there's these times in our lives when our children are running towards a cliff, like they're going to just fly off the end of it. And there's not a trampoline down there to catch them. They're going to jump off that cliff and they're going to crash at the bottom and we're doing everything in our power to stop them and to hold them back and to keep them from doing these things that we think are going to hurt them. And we have no control. So when we come to Jesus, we sit at his feet. We surrender, not only ourselves, our lives, this whole idea of perfectionism. God, I think I got to have it right all the time, and everything in my life is always supposed to be just so, and it's not. We just lay it down and surrender it to Jesus. As we look into his face, we experience his glory. We bow our hearts to him, and just in God's way, baby step by baby step we become more and more like Jesus and we experience that joy and that peace and that amazing grace that only he can bring to us I've always wondered how this world might have been different if in that moment Eve was tempted when she realized that there's something missing in my life what if she would just sat at the feet of God on that day when he came walking through the garden and said, hey God, what's going on here? Is there something missing? And she had been able to talk to him and listen to him and learn from him. How would our lives be different as moms when we sit at Jesus' feet when we get it right like Mary did and we we leave all that other stuff out there that tends to take our eyes away from what really matters in life, and we sit at Jesus' feet. I don't give parenting advice, because I'm pretty sure I'm not qualified to do so. <laughs> but this much, I, I really believe with all my heart that one of the greatest gifts that we can give to our children as parents is to love Jesus deeper. We get to get it right. We get to sit at Jesus' feet. My challenge to you on this beautiful Mother's Day is let's not miss out on everything that God has for us because we are holding on so tightly to all that other stuff that we think we should have. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all the moms in the room, for my mom, who is also in this room, for what she has given to me in my own life. I thank you for letting me be a mom and the incredible privilege that that is. 
Jesus, I just love you so much. And thank you for letting us sit at your feet, for opening it up, giving us this whole plan of salvation, a Savior, Jesus, where we get to sit at your feet and listen and learn and grow more and more like you, Jesus. We love you today, and we thank you for all of the good that you have done in our lives. Amen.